pleasure to be here and to uh, tell you a bit more about the current status in medicine. Um, I'm uh, in the unusual situations that I seem to have to defend personalized medicine. There are parts of medicine which are truly personalized, and I'll uh, show you the differences between those which are and which are not. The basic problem we have is that uh, we are all different. Um, a fact which has been widely ignored in large parts of medicine and pharma development, um, no tumor uh, has ever been seen or treated before and they are heterogeneous, as you have heard before. So um, if you break your arm in a complex break, you get a truly personalized uh, treatment because the doctor will use imaging techniques to identify the exact situation in your uh, arm and from experience knows uh, how different ways of treating the situation will affect the outcome. So uh, he has both the data he needs to personalize the treatment and the experience and the prediction power to uh, do it. Um, if you get the drug, uh, something completely different happens to you. Basically, the equivalent of having your arm broken and then in the left arm broken and then in the hospital getting a cast on the right arm because uh, the doctor cannot distinguish uh, the, the situation. And uh, in a clinical trial, maybe there were more people with a broken right arm. And that's because the doctor has no access to the molecular networks, the information on the molecular networks, which also differ from patient to patient, and he doesn't have the prediction power uh, to translate this enormous amount of information uh, into predictions of the complex changes introduced by drugs with complex uh, mechanisms. So uh, it's a purely technical point which discriminates between areas in which we have truly personalized medicine and areas it's which we don't. In drug development, we have at the moment neither the information, neither the data, nor the prediction power. Um, now, uh, therefore, we have uh, that situation. Surgery is truly personalized. Drug therapy based on first-line treatment is not. Biomarkers or precision medicine are stratified and uh, uh, the flagship project which we have proposed is uh, would have been would be uh, will be hopefully uh, truly personalized um, that has uh, all sorts of consequences um, in 2015 there was a paper in nature which argued that for the 10 highest crossing drugs in the US in that year uh, the response rates are represented by the blue figures in that diagram. And you can see there are a lot more red figures, non-responders uh, than responders, with, an av with a, a response rate ranging from between 4% and 25% according to this particular analysis. Um, this is not the only problem. Uh, drugs can cause uh, adverse side effects. Um, <coughs> in Europe alone, uh, drugs lead to more deaths than colon cancer, just behind uh, the deaths uh, due to lung cancer, the more lethal form of cancer. Um, this increases enormously the healthcare costs we spend in Europe, uh, roughly four and a half billion euros every day on healthcare, compared to that, uh, many of the problems which get the European people uh, excited, like the Greek debt pr uh, crisis, are really small fish. Um, simply 10% uh, of that roughly goes for drugs which do not work on the patient. Yeah? Okay. Um, <laughs> I think I, I thought I was talking into two microphones already. Okay. Um, <laughs> They are, um, going back, uh, we, have, as we have four and a half 
billion euros in healthcare costs. Uh, I don't obviously know the numbers for Israel. Um, roughly 10% uh, of that simply are the costs of drugs which do not act positively on the patients who receive them. Probably 20 uh, another 10% are the medical consequences of treatment with those drugs. 5% uh, of all hospitalizations, for example, in Europe are due to adverse drug effects. 5% uh, of the deaths in hospitals are due to adverse drug effects. And um, probably a truly personalized prevention could probably save uh, another 30 percent or so. So I would argue that we could, in principle, save off the order of two billions per day if we just did things right in medicine. Um, these costs are not stable. They increase faster than the gross national product, which uh, even if you are not uh, an economist, you will realize are a complete disaster uh, even in uh, societies with a stable population and most of Europe uh, is aging so it is obviously a situation in which we are which we're essentially rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic and not very sufficiently about uh, icebergs. Um, cancer is a particular uh, bad example in a sense or uh, under other respects a good example. In some cancer forms we have clear increases in survival time. Um, in other cancer forms we don't by and large. Uh, you should not forget that early detection obviously simply uh, increases the survival time by itself and obviously also makes it cancers easier to treat. So some of the progress is simply due to the uh, screening uh, approaches. Now, uh, the first part of the problem I've raised, the data, we have a much better grip on. We, uh, my department was involved in the Human Genome Project. We were centrally involved, for example, in sequencing chromosome 21, the second genome, uh, the second chromosome which got published. Uh, Any luck? Yeah, that's much better. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, at that point, we used machines which were, in the end, able to sequence uh, 196 independent sequences in one go per run. Now we sequence uh, billions. Uh, we sequence. Uh, we sequenced one genome in 13 years for roughly three billion dollars. Now we sequence uh, 60 on a single machine run for roughly 600 or more uh, dollars on the way. We are on the way to the $100 genome. So we have enormous progress uh, in characterizing individuals, individual patients. We cannot learn more in a sense of an individual patient than we knew about all of biology, human biology a few decades ago. Um, this is not the only technique which is moving rapidly. Uh, this is, for example, a picture from a, a so-called CYTOF, uh, spatially resolved CYTOF experiment showing a tumor in which you can detect up to 40 proteins with, uh, with cellular resolution uh, characterizing the uh, microenvironment of tumors uh, and the heterogeneity of the tumor in much more details than possible up to now. And there are many other technological breakthroughs which we can take advantage of in characterizing every individual uh, patient. These techniques have been used extensively to characterize tumor samples. 35,000 cancer genomes have been sequenced already. And in many cases, this can point out uh, actionable variants, which then uh, lead to the patient uh, uh, getting a specific drug uh, or uh, being included in a trial with specific drugs. Um, we uh, carry out both in the um, department for research grants uh, and in uh, in a spin-out company, Alacris Theranostics, which we set up to really makes uh, uh, technology available uh, 
to on a much broader basis. And Max Planck has many positive features, but it's not the place where you can start changing the world. Uh, so for that, we have to have <laughs> other uh, structures uh, to uh, carry out an extremely deep analysis of the uh, of tumor patients. Uh, this sequencing has been used uh, at different levels of accuracy from uh, individual variants, just basically determining the different RAS mutations over cancer panels, over whole exome to uh, what I consider the minimum uh, you really should do on every patient, which is low coverage genome to identify uh, copy number variation, LOH regions, a deep exome uh, has to be deep because the tumor material is not uh, necessarily high purity. Uh, it contains, uh, it's, it's a tumor is heterogeneous. Uh, and uh, a deep transcriptome because obviously it's as easy to uh, stop uh, recessive oncogene from acting by methylating the promoter as by finding, uh, I as by introducing a mutation uh, in the gene. So um, if you just sequence the, gene, uh, the genome, even if you do a whole genome sequencing, you have probably only half the information you need to really decide on the appropriate treatment of the patient. Um, this type of information is then translated into a so-called CMTA report for the uh, molecular tumor board at the charity and goes into the uh, treatment decision of the different patients. Both within a uh, research project, we are running basically a sort of clinical trial on metastatic melanoma, trying to uh, test the success rates of treatment based on the results which we uh, generate molecularly, and so those are some of the patients we've analyzed. And uh, as in other centers, you get sometimes dramatic improvements in the status of the patients with metastasis melting away. But you also have the problems that they very often return uh, due to the heterogeneity uh, of the tumors. So we have uh, precision medicine tools which now allow us to identify uh, drugs in situations where we have a high degree of causality, particular situation where we have a drug, for example, like Levac, made against a fusion protein, which we can characterize molecular by, for example, the transcriptome sequencing. Uh, there are other high causality uh, observations, but in many cases, this is, uh, it's, this is still, in the best case, only uh, help uh, fairly small fraction of the cancer patient. To go beyond that and to go from the stratification which we have in uh, precision medicine where we have very precise data but a very imprecise predictions uh, typically uh, to a truly personalized uh, therapy and prevention choice, we uh, think we will have to take an example from uh, what has worked in all other areas of our existence. In all areas of, the ex of our uh, existence, except for medicine and drug development, we have learned that in complex situations we cannot avoid making mistakes, but we can make them without consequence safely, quickly, cheaply on computer models of the real situations. So we don't design cars, testing them on prototypes. Uh, we don't train pilots on uh, uh, planes full of passengers. Uh, we have computer models, flight simulators, virtual crash tests, even uh, developing uh, electric toothbrush wouldn't be done in reality. You would. Uh, develop it first as a computer model before you start actually doing something. It's only medicine in which we really gamble with the lives of the patients which are getting treated. Um, and this is obviously something which has been impossible to change for a long time. We just didn't have the data to uh, make any models of that type because data are 
are the key to any forecast model. That's a quote from a meteorology paper. Uh, models are only as good as the data you could put into the model, the data you need to initialize such a model. Um, and uh, in weather forecast, we have roughly 75 terabytes of information to initialize uh, the models for every day's weather forecast. Uh, far cry from the doctor having the blood pressure uh, of the patient. If we had the equivalent uh, information on a weather model, which we have typically in clinical practice, uh, the weather forecast would be barely able to decide between summer and winter, much less get a, a good prediction. And just as a side effect, because I keep getting that uh, question, the weather is a much more difficult problem in some sense because it's chaotic. So very small changes in the starting conditions translate in the enormous effects after three weeks. That's not the case in biology, otherwise we wouldn't be here, and otherwise identical twins wouldn't look similar after 80 years. So we don't have to worry about that. We have an easier job in a sense. Um, Obviously, the models which we have to build are different. Uh, partial uh, differential equations do the job for uh, the cars or the weather forecast. Um, in uh, simulating biological processes, we use object-oriented modeling systems, which then translate uh, automatically, get tra automatically translated into systems of differential equations. Uh, I convinced that basically differential equations are uh, appropriate technology for modeling uh, 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 biological, biological processes. If you would need stochastic differential equations, we again wouldn't be here to discuss it. Um, so the object simply corresponds to the uh, components of biological processes. You have an object in a, the model of a normal cell corresponding to the RAS protein, and you might have in a particular model of a particular tumor, in addition, uh, object which corresponds to the uh, mutated RAS protein, which has then changed functions. For example, it will uh, activate downstream processes irrespective of upstream stimulations. Those models can then be automatically translated in systems of differential equations, and uh, the systems of differential equations reflect the accumulated knowledge from basic research over decades, uh, probably uh, funded by one billion dollar or more of uh, research funding all over the world. So uh, we can probably rely on the fact that the topology of the model is pretty good. What's missing is the parameters, and I would argue the m one major bottleneck between us and a truly personalized medicine is the parameterization of the very large models we have to deal with to be able to represent the differences between the different patients and the many different drug uh, targets which the, the drugs which we want to model uh, take into account, uh, uh, address. Those models are obviously therefore pretty large. Uh, this is one um, auto-generated image of uh, our larger model. Uh, and uh, I'm just showing you one result which seems to indicate that we're on the right track to be able to solve this parameterization model, which is not trivial because obviously we are dealing with uh, parameter spaces of thousands of tens of thousands of parameters which are non-trivial uh, problem computationally. So. Um, I just show you one result in which we very early on, by a much simpler approach, have been able to uh, treat uh, a woman with metastatic malignant, or propose a treatment for a woman with metastatic malignant uh, melanoma uh, based on, a, as I said, very simple model using a Monte Carlo approach for the, to overcome the need for the parameters. And you can see uh, the this patient nine, which is the one where you, the row, uh, which uh, has this circle blue uh, square, uh, 
seemed in the modeling to react to one particular uh, drug, uh, which actually is not has not been used in cancer therapy, but has been used in treating rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the, uh, the left one of the two is the rheumatoid arthritis drug. Uh, the right one is uh, uh, MEG1, MEG2 inhibitor, which is in between uh, approved for treatment and is, uh, ex uh, was expected to work in a sense, but hadn't been approved yet. And the treatment success in the modeling, we in this case indicate by the blue color uh, representing the concentration of MYC as a surrogate marker of cell division, at least uh, a large part of cell division uh, does uh, involve increases in the MYC concentration. So uh, the patient couldn't tolerate the standard treatment uh, anymore because of side effects, and therefore the patient tried the rheumatoid arthritis drug, which kept the uh, multiple metastasis stable, uh, and shrinking for a long time till a resistant metastasis uh, arose, which then uh, also got analyzed, uh, and it turns out uh, that both the new model and the clinical practice showed that it was not, it was resistant to this drug. So uh, those models are pragmatically reduced, restricted to the things we know uh, are affecting uh, the drug response. So, for example, for a patient receiving an oral drug, you would model the microbiome because that affects what actually enters the bloodstream, which forms a drug or drug metabolites en enter the drug stream. You have pharmacogenomic processes in the liver predictable from the whole genome sequence or uh, whole exome sequence of the patient. We have to model the tumor in as much of its complexity as we characterize. We are really limited by the input data. It's very hard to uh, analyze multiple biopsies from the same tumor. Um, and we should model the normal tissues because obviously uh, it doesn't help us to uh, have find a drug which kills the tumor if it also affects the heart cells of the same patient. And in the case of using uh, immunotherapy or taking into account the immune response to the tumor, we really should m be able to model the individual immune system of the individual patient, which we are still quite a bit away from. So um, essentially what we are trying to do is just uh, set up a situation in which the doctor, before treating the real patient, can test every possible tra uh, uh, treatment option, including combination drugs, which obviously are very much needed in a situation in which the tumors tend to escape uh, any therapy because of uh, heterogeneity and new mutations. Uh, on first on the virtual patient, and then he and the patient can pick the most appropriate treatment for that individual patient. So again, you make your mistakes on a computer model of an individual, of every individual patient. Um, this has consequences also for the drug development. Uh, it's a point has been raised how expensive drug development is. Uh, the therefore, that it is impossible to make a drug for every of uh, every individual patient. First of all, we don't have to make drugs for individual patients. We just have to take the available drugs and test all possible drugs uh, and drug combinations on the virtual patient. Uh, if we want to make dra new drugs, we can use the modeling to enormous advantage because. Uh, it doesn't cost 50 million to run uh, uh, to run a virtual clinical trial. Uh, virtual patients are insensitive against side effects of drugs, so we can basically take all the cancer patients which have been analyzed in ICGC or TCGA or in so many other projects and test their predicted response to a drug which has just been synthesized, so we know how uh, which proteins it binds to with which dissociation constant, or in fact, if you have powerful enough uh, docking uh, programs available even before the drug 
or any drug has been synthesized. So in contrast to the current practice where developing a new drug costs somewhere between four to 12 billion dollars, uh, if you divide the costs of developing, the pharma company spend every year buys a number of drugs which actually reach the market, um, we can, uh, we would be able to cut the cost by maybe two orders of, of magnitude or more. Uh, so drugs not only cost much, they often also buy you very often only limited uh, medical benefits because again, most patients which are, uh, which the, are uh, treated with the drugs don't respond. Um, so my working hypothesis is most drugs which fail in development and are not developed would help specific subgroups of patients. You just have to know which ones. Um, and that's something which we can expect to get, hopefully, from this type of models. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. What we aim for is useful models. Uh, we are obviously at an early stage. We are probably equivalent to the very early stages of weather forecasts in the middle of the last century. But even then, those numerical weather forecasts were useful. They were, for example, being used in the landing of the no in the Normandy. Uh, obviously with success. Um, to, uh, for this, we have been uh, applying for a flagship project, uh, 1 billion euros over 10 years, with the argument that without this technology, the EU would spend over seven years over the next framework program, 10 trillion on healthcare, two trillion on drugs to which the individual patients don't respond, uh, probably have the equivalent of the population of Milan die of adverse drug reactions and uh, come seven years closer to the implosion of the European healthcare system. And all that for the equivalent uh, for the amount of money which Europe spends in five hours for its current healthcare system. Unfortunately, this argument didn't seem to be strong enough for the referee panels. So uh, projects uh, have been evaluated in. This goes way beyond uh, cancer. Uh, it's a strategy which should be applied to all of medicine and all of prevention, and actually should also be applied to uh, situations which are purely uh, unrelated to uh, medical applications. So they should give everybody more control over their own biology. So if you wanted to train for a marathon, you should be able to design the ideal uh, diet and training schedule uh, for being able to do so without getting off your sofa. Um, that's uh, people who have been participating in uh, the slides I showed, the main people obviously. Um, Marie-Laure Jaspers group in Max Planck is doing a lot of the work. She's also uh, uh, guiding some of the work at the Alacus Diagnostics at our uh, uh, startup company. Uh, the work is, would be impossible without close interaction with uh, uh, clinicians at the charity and in other hospitals. And we also uh, work closely with mathematicians, computer scientists to solve the many computational problems. Uh, for example, uh, Jan Hasenauer at the Helmholtz Center in Munich and uh, Lucianito and Kostin Ziosdel uh, uh, in Romania. And that's uh, some of the prizes which our startup got. So we are somewhat encouraged that this is maybe the way to go. Thanks.
I think we're pretty close. We have, as I said, we have had successes already with very simple models. You have to keep, uh, keep in mind that the response rate uh, to uh, drugs in clinical practice is not fantastically high. You have heard some numbers. Uh, so uh, I would assume that with, uh, one b with effects of one billion uh, dollars of uh, funding for uh, for healthcare behind us that we should be able to make models which are good enough to improve on that. Uh, the basic problem is, as I said, if we go to more complex models, we have to uh, find the subset of the parameter space which uh, gives us the right uh, predictions on a test set. And that is something which requires uh, resources, time, data, computation power. And uh, unfortunately, that is something which we have only available through fairly small grants, which uh, slows things down. The problem is that, uh, for example, the um, solar cell industry uh, got subsidized with 100 billion in uh, to to make their model their, uh, the cells much more effective, much cheaper, and uh, the same type of investment, not even on that scale, would really be needed to develop completely new technologies in medicine, being able to really change the uh, way we treat cancer patients. So it's. I think it's just a matter of resources and willpower to uh, to get very far. We are using, uh, I've described this one case, we are using the models in, uh, in clinical practice now, but we need uh, to improve them a lot to uh, make them more useful. Uh, it's, as I said, the main problem is the, is the parameterization step. They are also often making bad know. decisions. I don't <laughs> yeah. Know. I don't yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ultimately, we have to run clinical trials in which we uh, compare the uh, response rates from 500 patients uh, getting the treat uh, getting treated according to the model with 500 standard patients. If 500 patients get up from their deathbed and go on vacation. I think every skeptic will believe that this is the way to go. So there is no problem. The problem is we have to develop the technology to that power. And if we only get the money to develop it, once we have run the clinical trial, which we can run once it has been developed, then it's hard without a time machine. No, uh, nothing. Okay, see, nothing of this form has been done, okay? You cannot model without the data input. So all the talk about uh, modeling uh, was complete nonsense. You cannot model without having the data which we only have now. There hasn't been molecular models by any company. If you tell me one, I would be interested. There's a lot of talk about AI, deep learning, uh, data-driven approaches, uh, I'm skeptical. Uh, I think this is uh, 
it's going to be very hard to train uh, in a purely data-driven form uh, neural networks to predict correctly on the training set uh, how to treat patients. As basically, uh, you need too many training data, and so you, uh, in a sense, you almost have to repeat the evolution of man to be able to do it in a purely data-driven form. So none of that has happened. People have talked just as much as they have now talked for 15 years about personalized uh, medicine without doing anything in that direction. Uh, there has been a lot of overselling. You just have to really discriminate what's, what the technology can deliver at which point in time. This is not possible just by listening to buzz uh, words coming from companies or from uh, pharma. Yeah, you said uh, in this thing you want to We need comprehensive data for prediction successes of 99.9%. We don't need comprehensive data for doing better than the clinic of today, is my conviction. And I think that is simply because we have uh, spent a lot of uh, money already on basic research. And I would argue that if, it, if this wasn't enough to make uh, models which are better than the current clinical practice, then we should have spent some money for public transportation or something useful. So I think it is, um, I th I'm convinced that basic research is useful, and my <laughs> conclusion is based on this. Um, I think in the next generation, we will have a more effective form of basic uh, research, which is mo partly model-driven. Ultimately, you can, uh, by uh, in research, you can only disprove. And so ultimately, what we will be able to do uh, after the initial steps is formulate everything we know in models, take the models which we make to treat cancer patients, uh, compare the results of, uh, uh, of the predictions to the, uh, the, to the real results and thereby eliminate models and improve models, improve parameters. So those models we are automatically self-learning simply because uh, the, uh, we keep eliminating, we keep disproving potential models. So whatever remains becomes more and more likely to be true. I think basically, uh, we, I think we are, uh, we n uh, the simple models will already predict the simple biomarkers. For example, the RAS effect, the effects of the uh, various, of, of many of the mutations which are being used as biomarkers. Uh, thanks a lot for a very inspiring Even in, uh, in Germany genetics, uh, even in classical Germany genetics, we know the 
Sure. Yeah, you should be able to model the effect of grateful juice uh, on the drugs which you take. Uh, it's uh, that is if it's a clear if there's a clear mecha mechanism there, or if you can deduce a clear correlation, then you can put it into the model. In fact. Um, Ultimately, the models will probably become hybrid models with strong mechanistic components and uh, AI type uh, parts wherever we don't have mechanisms. And uh, that is something which uh, many, many environmental exposures, we just don't have the mechanistic models, but we might be able to put them in by uh, tricks like that. Anything you can measure on a patient uh, which can be linked to the model is useful. So obviously those models should contain all the information, molecular as far as we can, ideally spatially resolved, uh, sensor information, image information. Uh, ultimately we will be limited only by uh, what we can afford to do with the patient rather than with the technology how to analyze the samples. Can you have a mechanism to integrate these kinds of things into your system through your model? For example, uh, if you had a, if you, if you in expand to heart disease, you would obviously use sensors to measure the physiology. You would link the physiological effects to the molecular effects happening in the heart cells. So you have to, you have to be able to link the components together either by, mechanis by mechanisms, which we would have to explore in, for example, how the heart cells react to the uh, pressure in the environment, or by AI type analysis, which then can be encapsulated as an object in a sense in a larger model. So uh, anything which gives you correct uh, predictions is useful, so I don't want to beat uh, any of the AI techniques uh, if they are useful, if they prove to make the right <coughs> predictions on uh, a test set. You know, all those techniques are fantastic on reproducing the training set. <laughs> the problem comes in when you try to make predictions on the test set. <laughs> uh, just reproducing the training set is not extremely helpful.